All right, uh, we need to start because we have uh, I plan to cover lots of things because there may be a review for uh, some of you. So things you already have seen. Um, so we really need to say something about expectation maximization because I know some of you never heard it. And it's an algorithm that I'm going to be using later on in the course. Uh, so it's actually most probably one of the top 10 algorithms of the last century. So uh, really, that's something you need to know about. So we uh, need, you know, we already have seen this concept of having hidden variables or uh, latent variables. And uh, in some sense, we have seen a little bit of uh, what's called latent variable models. The idea here is, you know, these are variables that we don't observe, but they are used to explain correlations uh, in uh, the observations. Okay, uh, but many times these latent variables, sort of, they are artificial variables that we introduce to simplify the type of calculations we do. Okay, and. Uh, Literally, I cannot imagine any model in Bayesian analysis that doesn't have latent variables. Right? It's very difficult. Okay? And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I need to tell you also is that if you try to express complex correlations in the data, when you introduce hidden variables, the number of parameters to describe, to define your model, it's actually significantly less if, but if you don't have hidden variables. And I know that uh, uh, you, you know, we haven't seen this. This is another course, basically. But if you try to explain, let's say, the correlations between the three variables here on the top and the three variables on the bottom using one hidden variable, uh, and you compare the number of uh, parameters needed to describe this model versus this model that directly tells you what depends on what through these errors that you see here, I can tell you that for uh, discrete binary variables, the model on the left requires 17 parameters to define. The model on the right, that seems to have everything you need to have in your model, all the type of correlations, it requires 59 parameters. Um, so rather than uh, going through the count of the variables, if you guys can uh, uh, go home, and uh, see where the 17 comes for binary variables for this model and where the 59 comes for that, that means you understand something ahead of the course. Okay? All right? Uh, I'm just giving you as a hint that to describe discrete variables, uh, distributions of one variable, we need only one parameter because this, all, everything, all the probabilities need to normalize. This requires two parameters, this eight parameters, etc. So when you look at the type of uh, uh, distributions that this diagram describes, you will see that the number is correct. So uh, latent variables are also coming uh, in a generative setting, right? So if you try to uh, generate data, uh, one of the methodologies that we will see uh, in this course is to assume that there is some low dimensional latent representation that through some mapping takes you from these low dimensions to high dimensions, all right? So this type of unsupervised learning problems, all of them are described in terms of latent variables. So in this case, you know, uh, you can have, let, let's say for each observation, one latent variable. So really there's no model reduction, or you can have many latent variables to many observations, one latent variable to uh, a high dimensional observation, uh, any sort of combinations, okay? But the idea of these generative models is that we're going to introduce some prior model on the latent variables, and then uh, somehow the likelihood is going to look like p of x given z. Okay? So uh, effectively, you can think you sample z, and for each z, you generate x. So obviously, we will be interested later on when z is very low dimensional and x is very high dimensional. Okay? So again, the only way you can uh, do this problem is through these latent variable models. All right, now in, in the context of uh, what we will do today, uh, we will introduce some trivial examples to demonstrate this concept of latent variables, but then I will use these algorithms uh, later on to do uh, a little bit more complex things. So let me go rapidly through something that uh, uh, you have seen, and if you have not seen it, you know it, because it's a common sense type of calculation. So here's the problem. 
uh, I give you n data points, uh, and each of the data points is a d-dimensional vector, all right? And uh, I tell you that I want you to partition it in capital K clusters. So I want you to group the data to uh, different clusters, and I tell you how many, all right? In this case, I tell you K. So uh, effectively, uh, we're going to have to compute uh, uh, these clusters by defining the center of each cluster that I call it mu k, okay? So you can think, you know, you have data, uh, uh, you want to fit them in a mixture maybe of Gaussians, so in this case, the prototypes, these clusters, each of them is a Gaussian, and you have to compute, in this case, the way I define it, I don't have any covariance, let's say you want to compute only the mean, okay, of uh, each Gaussian. So, uh, we're going to define a coding scheme that looks like this. For each data point n, we're going to define a variable r and k, all right, that takes the value 0 or 1, okay? So uh, if the data point n belongs to cluster k is equal to 1, if it does not, this is equal to 0. So we had, what we have to compute is, not only we have to compute the centers of these clusters, but we have to compute the assignments so if I give you the same data points that you see there, you're going to have to tell me to what cluster X1 belongs. So you're going to have to tell me what are the values of these R1K variables, right? Similarly for all the Xs. And uh, the way we do this, by we do it by a minimization of a distortion measure that looks like this. So the problem is uh, minimize J. Uh, with respect to the assignments R and K and with respect to the centers of each cluster. And you notice here I have a summation on each of the clusters. I mean, that's why I put R and K, because I don't know to which cluster each point is going to belong. So what's the physical interpretation when I say find uh, mu K and R and K so that this is minimized? So how do you understand this, looking at this expression? To what class this point, according to this equation, is going to be assigned? It will be assigned to the cluster that this point uh, is closest to the, the center of that cluster. All right? So, uh, so uh, it's sort of a proximity, if you like, measure, right? But remember, we don't really know what mu is, right? So we have to compute both mu and the assignments R and K. All right, so the optimization problem is trivial. And uh, basically, there's no mass derivation. But uh, I am giving you the sort of the answer. So the derivation is literally one line here. So uh, R and K will be equal to 1 if K is uh, the J that minimizes the distance between Xn and mu J squared, right? So we assign basically uh, the point n to the closest uh, 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 the closest uh, uh, Gaussian, if you like, or whatever model we have, all right, measured in the context of the distance between the center uh, mu j and the point x n. And so that's the assignments for each point n. And then if uh, we want to find the centers mu, we take derivatives with respect to mu, set them equal to zero, and you get the common sense answer that says that mu is the average of the points xn that belong to what cluster? The cluster k, right? But you notice again, we have seen this before, the summation is over all the data points, but this r is non-zero only for the points for which uh, r and k is equal to one. Right? So effectively what we do is we take all the points, we see which points are in cluster K, and obviously the empirical mean uh, defines the center of that cluster, and that's exactly what this expression uh, demonstrates. There is nothing probabilistic with this model, right? So that's the limitation of now. Everything looks sort of uh, uh, completely, the assignments are what we call hard assignments, right? We don't compute any probabilities, maybe that this assignment is not right or you know, it's wrong or some probability affiliated with this assignment. This is, we say, we assign when, uh, equal to one when k is the j that minimizes this, that's it. All right, it's a hard assignment. So let's see uh, graphically this algorithm. Uh, obviously, you should expect that you will get 
uh, at least one homework assignment that uh, it will import this algorithm. Uh, I uh, introduce this uh, letter C and M here uh, to affiliate this with the expectation maximization algorithm that we will see shortly. So uh, for now, don't pay any attention to what E and M means, okay? But you have to remember that whatever I'm going to say will be an analog to this EM algorithm we're going to see in five minutes. So we have these points here, and you notice these points, all of them have the same color, which means uh, I give you the points, but I'm not giving you the labels of the points. I've not said anything, uh, you know, from where this, what clusters these points are coming. So we are going to model this, let's say, with two clusters. So the first thing I do is I uh, define arbitrarily, I initialize the centers of these clusters, right? So that's what we start with those two crosses. And now I am going to uh, iterate between the calculation of R and K that you saw before and the calculation of mu. You remember there are two steps here. One is this uh, label assignments and another one is redefining what the centers of each cluster are. So here I am, uh, so given the centers on the second picture, I am defining the labels R and K. So I'm defining what is blue and what is red. And can you look at this picture and you remember it's everything distance based, right? So how do I define what's blue and what's red in this picture? I mean, at points that they're closest to this cluster there, right? I'm going to call them blue, the ones that they're closest to that, I'm going to call them red. So how do we do this? Uh, what's your algorithm? Say it again. I don't hear you. Classification. I know I want to hear uh, something. Uh, I want to hear something uh, geometric here. With well, what we need to do, right? What is this line here? What is this line that's there? There must be a reason for having that line. What's that line? It's the it, it, it's it's in the middle of the line connecting the two centers. So if you connect the two centers, right, and you take this line, the points that they are closer to this uh, center, I call them blue. The ones that they are closer to that, I call them red. Okay. All right. So we mark the points, blue and red. And now what we need to do is take the blue points and do what? Find their new center. Take the red points and find their new center. And the two centers, I cannot see them. I see there are two crosses there, right? There is one there and one there. So the two centers are there. And then what do we do? We relabel the points, right? You relabel the points so you take the connection between the centers, you bisect this, the points, you know, uh, in this direction, you know, uh, they're all red, on this direction they're all blue. And then again, you redefine the points and you keep iterating. So this is what uh, we will see is the expectation maximization algorithm. And the idea is this thing uh, will eventually uh, uh, converge, if not to a global minimum, to at least some local minimum. In this case, you can see the convergence of this distortion criteria J that we have. It really converges in very few iterations. Uh, so obviously, the algorithm is a little bit uh, computationally demanding because you know, as you iterate, you're going to have to calculate all these distances, these vectors, you have n of these vectors, uh, each of these vectors uh, is uh, of dimension d, and then you have k centers, so the cost of this calculation is n times k times d. Uh, but there are extremely smart algorithms out there that actually allow you to do assignments of points to clusters without ever having to compute any distances. So you can do this with geometric inequalities, you know, uh, but without literally computing this exactly, okay? And there are algorithms based on the three data structures, so you may want to consult some of the references there on those type of things. Uh, you can obviously, uh, as we have seen, and we will see everywhere in the course, uh, you can do stochastic optimization, Robbins von Ross, so you can actually update the centers one at a time. So if you take the gradient of the distortion, the loss function we had with respect to mu, uh, it comes to be uh, minus what you see here inside parentheses, uh, so you get something like that. And again, uh, we haven't elaborated a lot yet of this, but you know, as you keep adding more and more points 
to allow this thing to converge, the learning rate has to be uh, uh, decreasing as you add more points. Uh, there is you know, an extension of this uh, that allows you to introduce covariances for these clusters as well. All right? So what you saw in the K-means algorithm now, there is really no such a thing as there's no covariance coming anywhere. So there is an extension of this. Uh, and, and uh, these are the type of things that I, you know, I like, you know, everybody picked up their own projects, right? But I want things that they are extension of the class, right? So this is something uh, simple and someone who have programmed these type of things. Um, uh, as an extension, just to be uh, generalized this a little bit, rather than using uh, Euclidean distances there, you can actually put any dissimilarity uh, measure, any sort of uh, things that uh, measures the uh, uh, some idea of uh, the distance of uh, x from the centers of these clusters. I mean, things don't have always to be geometric in nature, right? So you know, you can use anything else you want them, all right? Anything else you want them. Uh, all right, let me see if I need to tell you anything. All right, so where are these uh, ideas actually are being used and you can have fun? In, uh, in, uh, uh, in practice, right? So, so let's consider, let me go on this uh, picture directly. Let's consider that I give you this image, all right? It's a color image. And uh, like every other image, it comes in a pixelized form, okay? So you can think of a rectangular grid. Uh, and I don't know in this particular case, let me see, maybe it's on the next slide. Um, uh, so this, for example, this image is 240 by 180 pixels, all right? So 240 but by whatever I said, 180 uh, pixels. So what we want to do is we want to do an image compression, okay? So each of these pixels is a mixture of three colors, all right? Red, green, uh, and, and uh, blue. So can you imagine uh, in what possible way we can use the k-means algorithm to do compression and you can see here it says k equal to 10, k equal to 3, k equal to 2. So in which way you think this, this trivial k-means algorithm, which is one line of programming, can allow you to do image compression and take this to these three images? So how would you implement, what is the idea here that we can use? So in this case, it says it's k equal to 10. So we're going, uh, what does k equal to 10 would be implying in this image? So basically 10 different colors, all right? And remember each color is a mixture of red, green, and blue, right? So we're gonna assume that there are only 10 different colors that make this. So we're gonna look, look at each pixel and we're going to substitute each pixel with what? With, with one of those colors effectively. Right? We're going to substitute each pixel with one of those clusters. So basically we're going to be asking, look at the actual colors there. You know, what is the center, the cluster, the color that is closest to each pixel? And we will substitute it. And you can see, in this case, we substitute actually every pixel with uh, two colors, all right? So, I mean, we basically have only two different colors. So each pixel will be either color one or color uh, two. And, and so this is the extreme compression. And, um, uh, and uh, so effectively, you know, if this is 100% of the original uh, image, you can see the type of compressions we achieve as we change the number of clusters from 10 to, to two. Uh, so there is some uh, simple analysis, you know, uh, so again, uh, the details are in the slides. So we assume that each pixel has, um, it's a vector that has red, green, uh, and blue. Uh, so we split it in K colors, and K colors, again, I mean uh, a combination of R, G, and B intensities, all right? So we select K of those. And um, uh, so when you do compression, can you tell me, so we're going to, you know, when you compress something to, let's say, k equal to 10, you're going to get rid of the original pixel values, these combinations of red, green, and blue. So to save this image in this compressed form, what type of information do you need to describe? I mean, give me all the details, basically. What do you need 
to actually describe eventually if you do the k-means algorithm this image. What information you need to save in your computer so you can reconstruct the image. So we we selected ten clusters, ten colors. So what do we need to first do? So we the, so we basically need to save those ten colors, right? The means of those uh, uh, clusters, and then what else? And then we need for each pixel to specify to what uh, color it belongs, right? So the cost of this calculation, when you do the algebra uh, in number of bits, it basically is uh, 24 times k, because you take, uh, uh, let me see where the 24 times k comes. Uh, this comes from uh, saving the centers, basically, of the k clusters. Each of them has you remember red, green, and blue, and you require eight bits for that. So three times eight, 24 times k clusters, 24 times k. And then you have uh, n pixels. And for each pixel, you need to specify out of the k possible uh, clusters, which cluster it belongs. And that takes log of k uh, bits. So this is the computational cost. OK? And you can imagine as uh, the number of uh, uh, Zen increases, right? So this only increases linearly uh, with the number of uh, the original pixels in the problem. All right, so this is actually a, a, the same, uh, another computer program uh, does the same thing for black and white images uh, out of uh, uh, Kevin Murphy's uh, book. So you can uh, look at another program doing that. And, uh, and you can actually use your imagination and, and use k-means to, to do things that uh, Maybe k means doesn't look to be the ideal algorithm. So in this case, uh, we're talking about the expression uh, levels of uh, uh, different genes at several different times. And uh, you notice some of these genes with time, they increase monotonically, some they go up and down. So really what you can do is here, you can take all this information in a vectorized form and cluster it in uh, 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 k uh, means uh, uh, genes Basically, in, in uh, uh, here, you know, obviously, you have to use, uh, uh, you know, you have to use your imagination because these are data in time. But basically, you can imagine uh, you cluster this around the following centers: some that monotonically increase, you know, with time; some that monotonically decrease with time, and something in between. Okay. So effectively, you say, look, all of these very complex uh, uh, time dependencies of the genes have to be one of those. Right? So you find which of those is closest, okay? and you assign to each of these genes uh, one of those uh, centroids. Of course, this, you have to compute them by running this, uh, the k-means algorithm, and, uh, uh, or you know, as we will see, the expectation maximization algorithm. All right. So let's try to generalize this uh, on the Gaussian mixed model. That's sort of uh, an extremely fundamental uh, model. Uh, you know, we're talking about a Gaussian mixture model. Tomorrow, it may become a Gaussian process mixture model. Uh, can, uh, you know, and the day after, it can become a mixture of experts models. So you have multiple regression models and take a mixture because one regression model cannot do the right job. So this is the same, the same type of uh, ideas. So reminder of the Gaussian, right? It's the multivariate Gaussian and the MLE estimates for the uh, mean and the covariance, right? So remember, M data points, this is what the mean, and this is how the covariance looks like. I have them there because you will see uh, when we work the details of the, uh, for the Gaussian mixture, some of the estimates for mu and sigma for each of the clusters uh, will look like this with some minor modifications. So let me see what the problem is. Uh, so, in this case, I uh, have three clusters, three Gaussians, and I generate data uh, from uh, these three Gaussians. And here what you see is, you see each of the Gaussians separately. So, you know, given what Gaussian I have, so given that k is equal to 1 or 2 or 3, this is the contours of each of the Gaussians. All right? So, these are the contours of each of the Gaussians. Now, uh, what do I see here? And what do I see here? 
I basically see, all right, uh, this uh, marginal distribution of P of X for the K labels have disappeared. I integrate them out. So basically, you can think, uh, you know, well, it comes out that basically, you know, we will see the actual equations that P of X uh, looks like this. Okay, that's the Gaussian mixture. So when I, I give you data from P of X, you don't really know, I mean, you can see here this data, you don't really know what class that generates them, right? The labels K have been integrated out. So these are samples from this Gaussian mixture, all right? So obviously, it would be fantastic if we don't have to deal with this, but we have to deal with that, because there, uh, if somebody tells you, you know what, that's the blue Gaussian, you can do miracles if you know it's a Gaussian. Here, it's a mixture. You know, at this point, you don't know, does it come from the blue, does it come from the red, does it come from the green? You don't know anything. So here is the, uh, the, the you know, again, the same picture. So we have uh, three Gaussians, and I mark the data, and I tell you this data coming from this uh, uh, red Gaussian, the green, and the blue Gaussian. This is what, you know, Typically, machine learning called uh, ancestral uh, sampling. Effectively, you decide first, you know, if you have a Gaussian mixture, okay, you say, uh, I'm going to sample from the red, and given the red label, you sample from the red Gaussian, gives you this, or I'm going to sample from the green or from the blue. So in this case, you actually know the labels, right? Uh, the labels. And the initial uh, selection of uh, if you're going to sample from the red, the green, or the blue, you do this with some prior probabilities that I call them here pi k. Okay? So, I mean, this is how you sample actually from a mixture. All right? So, if, if you have a mixture with this weights pi k, so you are going, to, you assume that this is a discrete random variable, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. So, you first sample uh, to decide what mixture component you're going to use. Uh, and you do this proportionally to pi k, and once you have decided what k is, then uh, you sample x from this Gaussian that you see there. Okay. Now, what we're interested in today is the following problem. We're interested in the problem where I don't give you any colors. I give you the axis, and I tell you, uh, go and find for me what pi k is, find what mu k is, and find sigma k. And the only thing I'm going to uh, uh, to tell you is how many k's I have. But even that, you have to trust me, uh, it's a trivial thing to, to actually uh, work a, a, a around. So you don't even have to specify the total number of clusters, but for the presentation today, I'm going to give you capital K, and I'm going to tell you, go and find pi k, mu k, and, and sigma k. Uh, and in principle, go in and assign for me a color to each of the data points that I'm going to give you. Okay, so you can imagine now that the colors that you have to assign to each point is these latent variables. So each point has a latent representation, and in this case, the latent representation is what? It's the color, right? But we don't know it, all right? You remember in the generative setting, if you know the color, you can generate points. How do you generate points from these Gaussians? Not the mixture, but this particular Gaussians. If you knew K, you can generate points, all right? But we don't know what K is for its point, so this is this hidden variable. So we have to actually assign colors to these points, all right? And not only we have to assign colors to these points, but also we have to find uh, what these uh, pi Ks are and what the means of the covariances uh, of each cluster. So uh, this is what we call a complete uh, color, basically, set of data points. Okay? This is not what we have. This is what we have. All, right? All the points have the same color. And here I want to have and figure out uh, you know, and do uh, some sort of probabilistic assignments to these points. So let me uh, introduce uh, this later representation. So uh, for each x, there is a z, right? And the notation that I have here, that you're going to learn in another course if you decide to take uh, probabilistic graphical models, x is given. I give you the points. That's why this is darker. So x uh, is generated from z, from this uh, you know, hidden color, if you like. And, but z is not known. 
and the joint distribution of x and z is basically p of z, p of x given z. And again, you can see the way you generate data. You know, you first select a z from this prior of z, and then given z, you select, you know, x from the conditional of p of x given z, which in our case is a Gaussian. Okay, so. Uh, Let's say if I, if I give you uh, data, for, let's say five data points, all right? Uh, each of these data points, okay, it has an affiliated z vector, right? And uh, the z vector is going to have, uh, it's a three dimensional because the colors that I'm going to assign to have three uh, Gaussians are going to be either my red Gaussian or my green Gaussian or the blue Gaussian. So you notice here, uh, these are the true labels, right? So like if I knew uh, the colors, then let's say for point one, it's a red point, point two is a blue point, etc. okay? But those are hidden, we don't really know. Uh, so let me uh, write first the prior on Z, uh, like what you see in this equation here. We have seen this type of things before, right? So what value Z can take? In my case, right, z uh, can be, uh, you know, either 1, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. So do you agree with me that basically it would be, uh, p of z would be 1, 0, 0 with probability pi 1? And then it would be uh, pi 2 uh, when z becomes 0, 1, 0, right? But this is sort of a compact way to write pi of z using these mixing coefficients in the Gaussian mixed with pi k. All right, so these pi k's are our prior probabilities for uh, these colors, and they are coming here in, uh, in, uh, in uh, defining the mixture. Okay? Now, if you know again z, all right, and I'm writing this explicitly, if you know that uh, my vector z is 1, 0, 0, then you know that this is uh, a red uh, point, and effectively, uh, uh, in this case, maybe I should uh, put this explicitly. Uh, this should be mu one, actually, and sigma one. Okay, so I'm going to be sampling uh, from the Gaussian defined in from mu one and sigma one. Okay, so let me uh, write the likelihood because you know that's the only information we have right now. We have data, so we, we need to come up with an algorithm that uh, maximizes the likelihood. So would you agree with me that if I knew z, that this, uh, for a given z, right? Uh, I'm sorry, for a given x, if I knew z, would you agree with me that the likelihood of x is like that? If I knew z, right, is the likelihood of a given point x given like that? Remember what value zk takes for that given x. Can be one zero. Can be you know uh, one or zero basically for each of the colors. All right. So if I give you that z is the red color, let's say what was red it was the first. Yeah. So if I give you that zk is equal to uh, one zero zero, will you get basically the p of x of z is the Gaussian for the first for the red component? All right. So again, it's a compact way for writing this with this product. It allows you to put everything together, uh, keep in mind that z is a discrete uh, variable that takes these values uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So this is the likelihood for one point. This is the prior, all right? So for this particular point, all right, for this particular point, if I write the joint likelihood, all right, I simply have to multiply. All right, so you multiply pk uh, times n to the power zk. And now you have to believe me. All right, so this is, you know, I have not written this for n points yet. Okay, this is just one point, uh, so I can uh, demonstrate to you what happens when you integrate z out. Okay, so this is obviously obvious. That's our obvious prior model. The joint uh, likelihood looks like this. So what I want you to do now is, I want you to marginalize this, uh, this distribution uh, by getting rid of z. So, and remember, the vector z takes what values? 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So if you sum for all possible z's, all right, which means 
uh, basically for uh, each of those z's, this zk is going to become uh, a delta function effectively. So if I substitute that summation ever over summation of the labels, right, I can, this zk will be a delta function. So when k and j are the same, this is equal to one, otherwise is equal to zero. So if you work the, the summation in z, and I want you, when you go home to do this, all right, you will immediately see that you get back the Gaussian mixture. So you may say, so we haven't really learned anything. You know, you are telling us for its x there is a z, you define some complex likelihood that looks annoying like that. And then you say that if I integrate z, I get back what I started with. So what did I gain? Um, so let me just tell you, and I think you, we will see this on a forthcoming slide, right? You know what you gain is the following. If you take the likelihood of p of x, then you know what you're going to have? You're going to have the log of the sum of Gaussians. Think about the log, and inside the log you have sum of Gaussians. In this case, if you take a log, what do you have? Take the logs of this expression here, of the joint uh, likelihood, what do you get? Are you going to have the log of the sum of Gaussians or what? What do you get? The sum of log of Gaussians. All right, so it's your choice. Okay, so uh, this trick basically introducing latent variables, it simplifies the algebra because it gets rid of the complication of having of the log of the sum of Gaussians, all right, and here you get the sum of the log of Gaussians. And we will see this explicitly in a minute. So let me uh, 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 do the following calculation. Let me calculate the posterior, given a point x, right? Uh, let me calculate the posterior that zk is equal to 1. So I'm asking, uh, what is the probability that this point x is a red point? Right? This is what I'm asking. So what is the probability that point x is a red point? And I'm using uh, Bayes' rule. Uh, so this would be the prior that the point is red, which you remember uh, in this, I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing this, right? So k equal to 1 would be red, k equal to 2 would be green, k equal to 3 would be blue. So uh, the, this, this prior is pi k. And this from our generality model is the Gaussian n of x uh, defined with mu k and sigma k. You see that? All right, so I'm asking again, if I give you an x, what is the probability that this would be a red, a green, or a blue point? And this is defined by this posterior probabilities that basically they are pk times this Gaussian divided by a normalizing factor. I call this the responsibilities. And the responsibility means for each k, let's look at k equal to 1, which is red. Given x, the responsibility that you see here is like what responsibility the red color takes in explaining point x. That's from where the name comes. All right? So what part of the point x is red? Before, you remember we had a prior model that was defined in terms of pi k. Now I have a posterior model that tells me what, you know, uh, responsibility the red color takes in explaining point x, the blue and the green color similar. Let's see the difference is this with plots. What you see here is the joint distribution of x and z. So these are the true colors. These points I knew it, they were red, these points I knew they were green, these points I knew they were uh, blue. These are the points plotted with the responsibilities. So can you tell me what's the difference of this plot and that plot? I mean, I'm colorblind, but maybe you can see something different in those plots. So when you use these responsibilities and you color the points, means that some points would be a mixture of red and a mixture of blue and a mixture of green. Right? Because these probabilities will sum to one, but you're not going to get you know, hard uh, assignments where it says x is blue or x is green or x is red. You're going to get that x is 
a little bit of blue, a little bit of green, and a little bit of red. And so this plot is a mixture of three colors, so each point has three colors mixed together on the top of each other. Now, some points, like these points, they come to be completely red. These points come to be completely blue, and some points may be completely green. But in this region here, you have to trust me, and you have to look at the computer program that you have a mixture of three colors, depending on these responsibilities that you see up there. All right. Uh, I already told you that uh, working with uh, uh, the likelihood of the original model that was a mixed model is not good because then you have a summation. Uh, I mean, if you take the logs for n data points, you have a uh, log of a mixture of Gaussians. Okay? So that's uh, a no go proposition, so it's not going to help us. Uh, so before I, I, I don't know how much time I'm going to have on this, but before I uh, proceed, let me just say a few pathologies of doing maximum likelihood estimation for Gaussian models. Uh, can you tell me what is going to happen to the likelihood if instead of saying I'm going to use uh, three Gaussians in the mixture, I use 25 Gaussians? What will happen to, to the likelihood? In other ways, as you increase capital K, what do you think is going to happen to the likelihood as you make the model more complex? I mean, you don't have to do any algebra, just think about it, right? The more complex the model, what? The more expressive the model will be, so what is going to happen to the likelihood? It will go up. All right? So pr that's problem one. Uh, and let's see a, uh, another problem. Imagine that somehow, uh, by accident, you select one of the centers of these Gaussians to coincide with the data point XN. All right, so in that case, all right, in that case, the exponential will disappear, and this Gaussian, uh, you know, computed at point Xn, uh, and with center Xn, it's going to look like that. And you notice when sigma for that Gaussian goes to zero, then uh, this this evaluation here goes to infinity, which means if you do maximization with uh, you know of the maximum of the likelihood. The, uh, an algorithm potentially, since it tries to maximize the likelihood, it will take you to a case where it says, you know what, one of the clusters should be centered on this point Xn and, and uh, the variance should go to zero. Why? Because that maximizes, takes the likelihood to go to infinity. Not good. Right? I mean, if you put really a good uh, optimizer, it will take you to this situation like this, which is not acceptable. So I want you to keep in mind that uh, eventually you really need to stabilize and, and avoid this type of things by doing some sort of uh, Bayesian analysis. Uh, if not nothing else, you know, you do a map uh, estimation. Now, if you don't do and if you program this right, uh, somewhere in your program you have to say if it happens that during the iterations the algorithm converges to this situation, you basically have to escape from that and you say no, initialize and get away from having this type of assignments that leads to a uh, likelihood that goes to infinity. All right, and uh, there is another problem. Uh, if you come up with a mixed array right, of uh, three Gaussians, uh, that we call them component one, component two, component three, uh, someone would say, uh, why is this component one is not component two? Right, there is an issue with identifying the labels because the all possible combinations you have are k factorial, so different algorithms will give you different labels. So an algorithm will not know anything about this unless you do something about it. So this is a serious pathology, so that we need to address. All right, uh, I literally have one minute. What, what time is the light going on on Fridays? 12.15. At what? 12.15. 12.15? 12.20, all right. So uh, keep anybody who knocks the door uh, outside. So what we do is l let's uh, uh, first, you know, see the actual uh, MLE problem. All right. So we said uh, if you don't work with latent variables and you do the likelihood for n data points, you have summation over n of the log of the summations of uh, this, uh, uh, the ga of this uh, Gaussian mixture. So what you need to do is uh, let's compute first the means of each Gaussian. So if you take derivatives with respect to mu j, 
uh, you're going to have this outside summation, then from the log you're going to get 1 over this, and, uh, and then uh, since you want to take derivatives with respect to mu j, you're going to have pi j times this derivative, and then I multiply and divide it by uh, uh, this uh, Gaussian uh, component j evaluated you know, for the point n. Okay? So I, uh, I have given the definition here, right, of, uh, with the two subscripts. K means component K, and this is point uh, N. So the reason I divide and multiply it is because we have seen in the previous slide that this is really the responsibility. Okay? Th this is the responsibility the cluster, the component J takes in explaining point N. So if you uh, take the derivative of this Gaussian with the exponential, and, uh, 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 it and take derivatives with respect to mu, it looks like that. So the answer that you get is very similar to what we got with k-means. So basically the center of the J Gaussian is evaluated by taking all the points that belong to the uh, J component. But you notice all the points are weighted not with hard label assignments the way we had in k-means algorithm, but they are weighted with what? They are weighted with the posterior probabilities, with the, the uh, responsibilities. All right? So, you know, some point will contribute to a center mu1, but also may contribute to the center mu2, because uh, a point n in part may belong to the red component, in part may belong to the blue component. So, so you weight all the points with the posterior responsibilities gamma. All right. So, what is the algorithm? Uh, the general EM algorithm, and we will see the, uh, the later uh, representation of this algorithm uh, obviously on Tuesday. So the algorithm is like the, uh, what we did with k-means. Uh, you uh, assume all the parameters, so you assume basically the uh, means and covariances of its Gaussian, and you evaluate the responsibilities, these posterior probabilities, and then uh, fix gammas and uh, uh, optimize basically your likelihood, maximize the likelihood to calculate pi, mu, and sigma for each component, and you keep iterate until convergence. Okay? So uh, the, the answers basically for the parameters when you do the optimization, they look like uh, uh, the MLEs of a multivariate Gaussian. The only difference again is they are weighted by these posterior probabilities. This is sort of very, very common type of uh, calculation. It comes everywhere, right? So you take all the points, all right, and you weight them to how much they contribute to the cluster J, and that's how we define the means and the covariances. And here is basically this mixing coefficients as well. So if you think, uh, if you take the summation of this on the right-hand side, it's really the number of points that belong to the cluster J, but the number of points, right, is defined in terms of posterior probabilities, okay? So uh, let me just give you uh, a little bit of, uh, of a picture, all right? So uh, we, uh, uh, we basically uh, start, we start with, uh, uh, let's say, two, two clusters here, two, one blue and one red Gaussian. So we fix those, uh, initial assignments are arbitrary. And step two, what do we do? In the expectation step, we color the points. And the coloring of the points is done with what? Using what probabilities? Using the responsibilities, the posterior probabilities. So each of the points here, they're not just blue or just red. Some points are a mixture of blue and a mixture of red. Okay? So we assign the colors. And what we do next? We recalculate now fixed with fixed gammas. We recalculate the, uh, the mean and the covariance for each of the Gaussians. So you get two new Gaussians. Then you recolor. All right? So you calculate new posteriors and you keep going. And that's the algorithm, and you can see it here uh, in action, you know, uh, moving like that, okay? And uh, uh, the posterior probabilities look, I showed you this picture before, and, uh, uh, and so and this is another program doing the same thing from uh, um, uh, Murphy's book. All right, so what we need to do is on Tuesday, the likelihood, by the way, is maximized very nicely in this type of problem. So what we will do is we will discuss uh, about a later representation of this, which is way more powerful than uh, working directly with the Gaussian mixture. So we will see that on, uh, on the lecture on, uh, on Tuesday. All right, see you then.